scripture passage is Psalm 1, 1 through 6. You're invited to turn there, follow along on the screen. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whether whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff in the wind that blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is God's word. Thank you, Brianna. I'm curious to know um, if uh, the book of Psalms is uh, significant to you guys. How, do, does anybody here find the Psalms to be really helpful, really encouraging? Okay, a few of you do. Um, I think as a younger person, I didn't really get it. <laughs> but as I've gotten older, I find that the Psalms are more and more dear to me. And uh, I'm not exactly sure why that is. Maybe more life experiences, I don't know. But uh, they are definitely becoming more and more dear to me. And I have actually been looking forward to what we are beginning now this morning for probably over a year. It was over a year ago. I, I, I thought, how about we attempt a series of sermons on the Psalms? Of course, that sounded entirely undoable since there are 150 of them. And I didn't think a 150-part sermon series was a good idea. <laughs> I don't know that you'll make it past 10. So I thought, well, how about we just do favorite psalms? But how do you pick favorite psalms? I mean, that is still far too broad a category. And then I thought, well, let's just pick 10 favorites. And I said, well, who's 10 favorites? So I did settle on 10 psalms that will comprise our sermon series on favorite psalms. There are 10 of them. And it's a combination of psalms that are registered on my radar screen as being favorites, either to myself personally, or as I have observed um, historically, the people of God, these psalms seem to have been special and important to people for, in some cases, a couple thousand years. And so I did pick 10 of them that fit that sort of combined category. And I do want to issue a disclaimer here at the beginning of the sermon series, though. When we talk about people's favorite psalms, that's very personal. And um, you all, no doubt, have a favorite or several favorite psalms. And I just want to let you know that some of your favorite psalms may not wind up in this series, okay? I'm sorry, but realize that there are 140 of them that didn't make my cut, okay? So, so the chances of, it, uh, of yours winding up in there aren't really all that great. But uh, I think you will agree that the psalms that we will choose to talk about are significant psalms, and they are psalms of great value. And we've tried to pick psalms that sort of cover a wide range of human experience. And uh, that's something we'll be talking about as, as we move forward, this wide range of human experience. I think some of you guys know that the book of Psalms is actually a very ancient hymnal. Did you know that? Yeah, it's a very ancient song book. And it is a collection or a compilation of the songs that comprise the worship music of ancient Israel, which is really cool. So if you want to think about something that will really blow your mind, here it is. Jesus sang these songs. Now that's really cool to think about. Now we have no idea what the tunes were to these songs. Those are not part of the inspired canon. Sometimes I've, had, I've heard people try to set psalms to music again, and they tried to keep it in the spirit of the ancient Jewish musical tradition. And you've heard some of those ancient Hebrew-sounding renditions of the psalms, no doubt. But nobody knows what the songs sounded like. But we do have a record of their texts. And we don't have them... We're, we're not going to study them in their original language, but we at least have English translations of those texts. Texts And it's so fascinating to me to think of men like Peter and John and, of course, Jesus himself singing these songs. These songs were part of the prayer life of Jesus. These psalms were a part of his public and private worship. So fascinating to think about. 
Now, I think that, you know, a lot of these psalms were penned by a person whose life we studied uh, a couple years ago, a year, two years ago. I don't remember how long it was, but uh, his name was David. He was king of Israel for a good chunk of time. And you also remember that we talked about the fact that David was an extraordinary musician and an extraordinary songwriter. Uh, he was actually brought into the palace to play music for the king. So he's clearly a good player. Okay, and we have a record of so many of the lyrics that he wrote. And what's amazing to think about is that these psalms have staying power. Well, they are a part of the inspired canon of, of, of the Bible. So we believe that God has preserved these for us because uh, they matter to our lives now. And I was just thinking as we were singing this morning, and uh, we even had some kind of a comment made already about this. How many of these songs that we sang here this morning you think will be still being remembered 3,000 years from now? <gasps> Probably not. Well, they don't have the benefit of being inspired by God like these in the canon, but uh, they won't have staying power like these psalms did. Now, David didn't write all of these psalms. There were others of Israel's musicians who contributed quite a bit. So some of the psalms were written by people other than David. Sometimes those are named and sometimes they are not named. The psalm we're going to study this morning actually is, we don't know who the author was. We can guess, but uh, the author is not named. Some of these psalms, I am serious, go back over 3,000 years. Some of the psalms go back all the way to Moses. <laughs> wow. Now, I'll put this on the screen for you. One of the things that I've come to love most about the psalms is their remarkable breadth. I mean, these were not one-dimensional. They cover a wide experience of, uh, uh, of human encounter and human emotion and human thought. It has been said that the book of Psalms contains the whole music of the heart of mankind swept by the hand of his maker, which is a beautifully poetic expression. But what's it mean? Well, I think what it means is that the Psalms grow out of such a wide array of human experience as people throughout time have sought to interact with God in the midst of those circumstances. And as you well know, life has its ups and downs, and you seek to experience God and relate to God and stay faithful to God and communicate with God in the high times as well as the low times. But here's the deal is I don't think Christians, at least in the circles that I have spent most of my life, I don't think that we're very good at acknowledging the validity of such a wide range of human experience in your relationship with God. Let me explain what I mean when I say that. Some people I've met over the years seem to think that walking with God is supposed to be one long, uninterrupted string of bubbly, happy, clappy praise songs. And if that is not your countenance at a given time, they think something is wrong with you spiritually. And they will make you think that your faith is lacking. It is not sufficient because you're supposed to be happy and cheerful and clapping and singing praise songs all the time. I've been told that myself. Now, what I would have to say here is that I cannot align that philosophy of the Christian life with what I see in the Psalms. It doesn't hold true when you work your way through the Psalms. The reality of the fact is this. Sometimes you are on top of the world. You feel like you are soaring. And my friends, God is there with you. But the other part of the experience is that you have times when you are not soaring. You feel like the weight of the world is crushing down on your shoulders, and it's very difficult even to know to how, how to put one foot in front of the other. But what I would have you know, if that describes your experience this morning, is that God is there too. He has not abandoned you, and he has not left you, despite how you might feel. Some of the Psalms, guys, were written from those very heights of elation. But there are also Psalms that were written out of the depths of despair. Did you know that there are even Psalms that were written by people who were struggling with a sense of God's abandonment? They felt abandoned, but I, when you read them, you feel like they are hanging on with white knuckles 
saying, God, where are you? I will not come to believe that you are not there. I refuse, and I will choose to cling to you. And so you see that experience in the Psalms. Matter of fact, one of those Psalms, did you know, was on the lips of Jesus as he was being tortured to death. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you realize he was quoting a psalm? So Jesus wasn't the first one to feel that sentiment, even though nobody has ever felt it to the degree Jesus did. <laughs> well, one, one really broadly known preacher has said, and I sort of paraphrase this, he says, the psalms show us how desperate people pray. (laughs) Which I think is a fabulous statement. (laughs) And I would say that the Psalms also show us that it is entirely appropriate to pray, no matter what your experience is. So I think it is very appropriate to talk to God, to pour out your heart to God, whether you're experiencing deepest joy or deepest agony or deepest doubt. All times are appropriate for you to open your heart to God, and the Psalms show us that very clearly. Now, so where do we begin this series by, other than talking just in generalities like we've done so far? Well, I thought, well, let's start at the beginning of the Psalms, even though we're not going to stay chronological in this. How about, I chose Psalm 1 as one of the Psalms to make my list of favorites. Now, I will tell you my first memories of Psalm 1. One, and this is what Brianna read for us. My first memories of this psalm date back to my later elementary years. I grew up in northern Indiana, and as an elementary student, uh, my family was very involved in a local church there. It was a little local Baptist church in, in, in Sherville, Indiana, actually. And uh, we were there all the time, highly involved, and the particular memory that I am recalling this morning in this connection was a hot summer, sunny morning, and I was at Vacation Bible School. And uh, it was a beautiful day. I remember feeling very, very happy at this time. And I was uh, with the other kids and the teachers in this uh, metal building that our church had constructed to serve a dual purpose as a bus barn and ministry space for things like Vacation Bible School. So it wasn't a fancy thing. But I was going for, back and forth at the time between two different typical Vacation Bible School activities. One of them was a craft. Okay, you can all relate to that. And this particular craft was I was creating a decoupage. You know what that is? We, they'd cut out some photos from a magazine or something or other. We'd slap them on a piece of wood with glue, and then we were varnishing over them. And while we were waiting for the varnish to dry on, on one coat, which was overnight, and it took like a whole week or two weeks to do the whole project, when we weren't slapping varnish on uh, the, the decoupage, by the way, my decoupage project is, is hanging in the Smithsonian. No, just kidding. <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to that thing. But when I wasn't doing that, I was memorizing verses in a crash course to go over and recite them one by one to a listener. And it was, of course, Psalm 1. And by the time the week was over, I could recite Psalm 1 in the King James, of course. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the sand of the scornful, or whatever it says. I can't. But anyway, I memorized Psalm 1. It's very flowery. It sounded very British. Of course, King James English will sound that way. And I think that there was, well, I'm quite sure that there was a prize awarded for my labors of memorizing Psalm 1 by the end of the week. I don't remember what the prize was, but I can tell you what Psalm 1 says, I remember it all of these years later. Now, in this psalm, Psalm 1, probably first and foremost, most obviously, you see that there is a contrast being presented in the psalm. A simple contrast between two kinds of people. On the one hand, there are those who place their faith in God, seeking his ways for their lives, 
And on the other hand, in the psalm, there are those who reject such a notion of God and seeking to live according to his ways. At least they reject the notion of God practically as though there is no God. They might still theoretically hold to the idea of a God, but their lives are lived as practically as though there is no God. And those two are contrasted in Psalm 1. Now, I want you to listen to just the first part of the psalm again, and I want you to listen to the writer setting up the contrast. See if you don't see it. Psalm 1, verse 1. Here it is. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Do you hear the writer setting up the contrast? Here's the one who doesn't do this. Now, later he's going to go back and tell you what he does do, or she does do. Okay? Now, it's interesting, again, that the psalm writer starts off with the negative part of the equation. Blessed is the one who doesn't X, Y, or Z. And specifically, what are they? Who doesn't walk in step with the wicked. As the King James said, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the one who does not stand in the way that sinners take. King James, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Or, blessed is the one who does not sit in the company of mockers. King James, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. <laughs> now, something struck me here as I listened to this. Did you notice the progression of postures, physical postures, in this opening verse of Psalm 1? We have walking, we have standing, we have sitting. And there is a progression. Walking, I had this picture in mind of some guy just sort of walking on by, <laughs> looking out of the corner of his eye, back over his shoulder, <laughs> walking around, just walking back and forth. <laughs> and then the next posture is not walking anymore, it's standing. Hmm. Contemplating, thinking. And then the next posture is sitting down. Okay, you've made your decision. You're going to park it. This is where I'm going to be. This will be my people. This will be my home. This is my place. Hmm. Have you ever noticed how destructive choices sort of follow that progression? I don't think it's by accident that you see this here. Yeah, you think about the things that follow that progression. A person does not wake up one day and say, I think today I will choose to become drug addicted. No, it doesn't work that way. I think I would like to develop a porn addiction today. Nah, that's not the way it works, is it? There's that progression. There's the walking, then there's the standing, and then uh, there's the sitting. Okay? It's very fascinating. Destructive choices generally happen in this way. Well, many of them do. Now, keep in mind what the psalm writer is doing as he starts this psalm. The psalm writer is saying that the truly blessed person is not that guy. The blessed person is not that girl who does that whole progression. Now, let's take a lesson from this, guys. The truly blessed person is the one who does not even start down that road. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, I want to add to that. I thought, I would also say this, the truly blessed person is a person who, ever, who having gone down that road and encountered destruction of some sort, decides I am no longer going to be that person. I will not walk in that pattern anymore. I will not sit in that place any longer. Thank God that he is gracious and he gives us the opportunity to rethink and to repent. He does. Now, what does it mean to be blessed? Because this is the whole concept in, the, in, the, in this chapter. Blessed is the one who does not, but who does, hmm, what does it mean to be blessed? I mean, we use that word in so many different ways. It's common. How many times do you have a conversation with somebody and, uh, and you say to them, how are you? And they say, well, I'm blessed. Oh, I'm blessed. You've had that happen. Maybe even you use that, that language. But what do you mean? 
Sometimes you wrap up a phone call with somebody and they say, do you have a blessed day? Have you had that one? Have a blessed day. What does it mean? Well, let's consider that. In our culture, we use that expression with certain preconceptions of what it means to be blessed. Listen to how we use the term blessed. Tell me if I'm right. Well, Frank was blessed with extraordinary good looks. You probably said that about somebody whose name wasn't Frank. Aunt Alice is blessed with good genes. She's 75, but she looks like she's 32. She was blessed with great genes. What do we mean when we say blessed? Bobby has been blessed with marvelous athletic gifts. Sue has been blessed with extraordinarily brilliant thoughts. Blessed. And all of these things are indeed blessings from God, are they not? And by that we mean that they are not the result of any choices or labors on the part of the person who possesses them. These things have been bestowed upon those who have received them as gifts. They've been blessed in this way. So that's part of it. But I will also say this. Beyond this, in our culture, have you ever noticed how hard it is not to associate blessing almost entirely with money and stuff? It's very difficult for us to get out of that mindset. But I will tell you this, that here in this psalm, as in many other biblical contexts, this word blessed has a different connotation. It's much bigger, it's much broader than that. The Hebrew word that we translate as blessed here can equally be translated as happy, but it's not a thin veneer of happiness. The biblical sense is really quite expansive. It's quite deep. It means being endowed with ultimate well-being. Being endowed with ultimate well-being. It's not a mere temporal well-being in view here, or the appearance of well-being that usually accompanies earthbound prosperity. No, it's much deeper. It's ultimate well-being. And I'll put this on the screen. In the scriptures, and specifically in this psalm, since we're dealing with this psalm, this ultimate well-being is the result of a person's right relationship to God, their creator. This ultimately blessed, ultimately happy person's faith in God is such that it leads them to live in certain ways and thus to enjoy the benefits of walking hand in hand with him. And so, the psalmist is saying this, to, that being blessed has to do with experiencing the pleasure and the smile of God resting upon you. The one who is blessed is the one upon whom the full favor, the full friendship, the fellowship, and the delight of God rests, which is a wonderful and beautiful place. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I wanted to do is I kind of thought I would, have, I would have changed some of the wording in that last slide. And if I were to redo it, I probably would. I'd say it, the psalmist is saying that being blessed has to do with knowing that the pleasure and the smile of God rests upon you. Because sometimes your experience doesn't necessarily feel like you're, you're having the smile of God rest upon you. But it's knowing that this is the case regardless of the feeling. The feeling is a wonderful thing, but you're not guaranteed the feeling all the time. Now remember, though, as I said before, there are two kinds of people that are being contrasted in this psalm. Number one, there are those upon whom the favor of God rests. And on the other hand, there are those who are walking outside of that favor. Maybe not entirely because there's still common grace, but the favor of God is not resting them in the same way that is being experienced by the person who is trusting and walking with God. Now, I want you to look at the psalm again, and this time we're going to read past this initial negative description about what the blessed person does not do, and we're going to move into the positive statement. Now, follow it again. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of Yahweh. 
and who meditates on his law day and night. Now, there's a word in that last verse that attracts my attention like a beacon. And I think that word is key to the entire psalm. I think everything rises and falls on this. In what do you truly delight? Because the blessed person finds his or her delight in a certain place, in a certain person, in a certain thing. And the person who does not fit this description of blessedness, their delight is elsewhere. This is what you begin to see in the psalm. The psalm writer says that the person who is ultimately blessed or ultimately happy is the person who delights in God and his way. The word the psalmist uses is law. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. It's the person whose very heartbeat, whose greatest joy in life is to know well his or her creator, and to walk with that creator in the creator's way. That is the blessed person. Now, personal question. Don't answer it out loud, but does that describe you? How well does it describe you? Ask yourself, what is your true delight in this world? Have you come to the point where you prize knowing and walking with your creator above all things? Now, verse 2 in this psalm says that the truly blessed person is the one who delights in the law of the Lord, all capitals, Yahweh. And immediately we think Ten Commandments, but it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's much bigger than that. The law of God here, he's describing God's character and all of the desires that come out of God's character, what God desires because of who he is, what God expects because of who he is, the parameters that God puts upon his creation because of his character, all of this is the law of God as determined by his character, which would include things like the Ten Commandments, but it's much bigger than that. And I thought there are different postures in life that we can assume toward the law of God, aren't there? Many different postures. I want to give you four of them. A person can be ignorant of the law of God, can't they? Maybe to a certain degree, although Romans chapter 1 has something to say about that. There are certain things that we kind of know instinctively. One can be ignorant because they are disinterested, but not it's not always that way. You know, I think you could be ignorant not simply because you're disinterested, but you can certainly be ignorant because you're disinterested. That's one possible posture towards the law of God. Ignorance of it and disinterest in it. Another possible posture towards the law of God is rebellion. In other words, you know God. You know the law of God. You know that he expects something of you, but you don't want to go there. You really want nothing to do with that. You want to be able to determine things for yourself or for some, or based upon some other authority. And so you are in a posture of rebellion against the law of God, the character of God. Now, there's another possible. I do this sort of see, see these as a, some sort of a continuum. A third posture toward, against the law of God or towards the law of God is what I will call obligatory compliance. Obligatory compliance. You know God, and you know certain expectations of God for you. You don't really like it. You don't really care for it. But nonetheless, you think it is in your best interest to toe the line. And so, you realize how it's sort of based in, in, in uh, what's the phrase, self-interest? You don't want the consequences of stepping out of line. You don't want the consequences of living in rebellion. And so you obey but it really, there's a self-interest. And, and, and I'm not saying that that's all bad. I'm just trying to help you recognize it, okay? And yet, the psalmist seems to have a completely different posture towards the law of God in his mind as he writes this. Check out the fourth posture. I will call it embrace and alignment. Embrace and alignment. This person has recognized God and the way of God and understands to some degree the heart of God behind it and God's purposes behind it. 
And he not only complies, he does so because he recognizes it to be the wisest, most beautiful, most brilliant thing that he or she could ever do. And so there's an embrace and an alignment. I choose to align myself with the law of God. Frankly, this is where I find my delight. That is a completely different posture. And I think, okay, so if you can follow that spectrum, where would you see yourself on the, on the spectrum? Be fascinating to know. Now, in Psalm 1, I sense the psalmist is actually kind of working backwards for some strange reason. I don't know why the psalm writer didn't. Maybe it's because it's poetry. Maybe it's because it's a song lyric. I don't know. But he's kind of working backward. He, he puts the negative first. Okay, I pointed it out to you. He does the negative thing first, and then he puts the positive thing after the fact. But in his mind, clearly, the first and foremost thing is the positive, the delighting in the law of Lord, the Lord, the law of the Lord. And he says that because the person is so highly prizing his creator, God, because he or she so values God's wisdom and God's ways, that person could never walk a different path. You know, that path that the godless typically take. Why can't he take that path? Why won't he? because he so greatly values this one. And that seems to be the emphasis in the psalm. Now, I want you to listen for that as we look at the verses again. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that the sinners take or sit in the company of the mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord Yahweh and who meditates on his law day and night. There's no begrudging there. And I also was thinking about this whole idea of counselors, because blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That's the way the King James said it. Who are your counselors? Who are the people who really have your ear? Who do you take your cues from? Whose counsel do you seek when making a decision or wondering what to do? And what do those, what do those persons' lives look like? Because the psalm is saying that there is a blessedness in choosing counselors who don't fit a certain description. And yet, there's a blessing in choosing those who do fit a certain description. And I was thinking, okay, do the counselors in your life ever tell you things you don't want to hear? Or do they just tell you what you want to hear? There was a, there's a brilliant proverb. I should have put this on the screen, but I neglected Listen to this proverb. It's short. Hopefully you can remember this. This is Proverbs 27, verse 6, and it's about counselors. The proverb says this, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. What's he saying? Saying anybody who always just kisses all over you and never tells you anything hard is not your friend. It's an enemy. You want to know who your friend is? They will tell you when you got egg on your face. They will tell you when you're making a stupid decision. They will tell you, look, this is not going to end well. And you don't want to hear that. You might stop being friends with them. I've had that. Okay? What does the Bible teach about this subject? Think carefully about who your counselors are and who your friends are. Now, Back to Psalm 1, verse 3. Here's where it gets beautiful. And I love the imagery. This is, this, the artist is painting a picture here, the songwriter. I love the lyric. Here's what he says. That person, this is the one who delights in the law of Yahweh, who meditates in that law day and night. That person, verse 3, is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. And I think there's a better way to translate that last phrase, by the way. It really has the sense of, and whatsoever they do, they prosper. It's not like if I set my goal at 57 years to become an NBA point guard, that I will get that. That's not what this is saying, okay? That's not going to happen. That will take a miracle. Well, maybe if I had enough faith, I could move that mountain. But no, I'm just saying that's not what's in view here, okay? The person who delights in the law of the Lord is a prospering person 
whatever is going on circumstantially. This is the gist of it. Now, look at the photo on the screen. Don't you want to be there? I want to be there. This is the picture that the psalmist wants you to see in your mind. I want to be that tree. The psalmist is telling us that there are riches to be had in fellowship with God that are not to be found elsewhere. Do you want to be like the tree there in the foreground? The riches that are to be found in walking with God, finding your delight in God, are the stuff of true wealth. He wants you to understand. Now, I have to tell you guys, I believe that with all my heart. And I believe it more today than I have at any point previous in my life. I am convinced that this is true. Like a tree planted by the streams of water, what is this a picture of? First, I think it's a picture of inner flourishing. Remember the tree as we look through this list. It's a picture of inner flourishing. So he's at, I ask you, where is inner health and inner righteousness to be found? In a relationship with God. You feel like you're not the healthiest person in the world? Well, where are you going to start? This is where you need to start. It's also a picture of identity, which is deeply rooted. I can't picture that tree having an identity issue. Am I a bulrush? Am I a dandelion? No, the tree's not thinking, but you understand the imagery here, okay? <laughs> he knows who he is. It's deeply rooted in God. It's a picture of strong anchorage. No wind is going to come along and move that tree. That's a rarity. It's a picture of rich fulfillment. And I think of the thirst being perpetually and fully quenched because of where the tree has grown. It's a picture of fruitfulness. And I was thinking, okay, fruitfulness as a human being, producing as a human being is meant to produce to the enrichment of other people. Hmm, where is that found? It's found here. It's a picture of permanence as opposed to the dandelion or the daisy. But the psalmist does create a flip side. So he is a beautiful artist. He's painted the beautiful picture of the tree planted by the rivers of water. But now look what he does. He paints the flip side. Verse 4. Not so with the wicked. They're like the chaff that the wind blows away. So all of that image that you just saw, he's saying the one who does not delight in the law of Yahweh fits this latter description. It's not, okay, well, we don't know a whole lot about chaff. You probably could tell me what you think it is. But in an agricultural, an ancient agricultural society, this was a, this was a beautiful image. And look at the photo here. Here is a picture of a guy in that part of the world with what's called a winnowing fork. It looks like a rake, but it's a winnowing fork, and he's got this huge pile of grain, and he's <laughs> tossed it up in the air, and they always set this field, or they, they set the, this, this floor in the area at the top of a hill or something where the wind is strong. So when they keep throwing it up in the air, what is the wind doing? <sighs> yeah, all of the chat, all of the unwanted, all of the useless stuff is blown away through the process. And what remains is that which is of value that which is good, that which is desired. And he's saying that the person whose delight is in something other than the law of Yahweh is like the chaff that the wind blows away. What a description. It's remarkable. Now, here's how I wanted to conclude this morning. There is a, a short couple of sentences that I found in uh, a commentary called the Pulpit Commentary. It's kind of an old standard. And the author has said this, and this will be our conclusion. This is what he had to say in reflecting upon Psalm 1. In the life of the godly, there is the truest pleasure, the noblest usefulness, the heavenliest beauty. And the charm of all is permanence. 
there is not only moral freshness as where there is real soundness of health, but there is enduringness. Now, this is brought out vividly by contrast. The ungodly are not so. With them, says this author, there is no reality. Separated from the true life, everything is unstable and uncertain. There may be a kind of prosperity, but it is false and delusive. And then he quotes, the pleasures of sin are but for a season. But the love of God <laughs> is forever. So, my friends, choose wisely. <laughs> choose wisely. Who will you be? In what will you find your delight? Because this is what the psalmist wants you to realize. Let's end in prayer. Almighty God, thank you for such a beautiful passage of Scripture, brilliantly written. We can't help but see the images. Help us to be wise. Jesus described it as building upon the solid rock as opposed to building on sand. <laughs> Another graphic illustration. Teach us to be wise. Thank you for meeting with us. Spirit of God, apply now this psalm to our hearts according to the will of God. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.